Well, uh, good evening. You can take your seats, please. Uh, good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ian Whitaker. I'm the Director of Strategic Content here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Great to see so many of you here on this, on this wintry night in Chicago. Uh, before we began, you might have seen some, some uh, charts and a very controversial map of the Midwest on the screens. Um, it's from a new re report the Council has just published called Vital Midwest, The Path to a New Prosperity. I mention that because it's really interesting context to tonight's conversation. It's all about uh, economic and social trends shaping the region. Um, before we begin, uh, please know we are on the record. We're live streaming. We welcome your social media engagement, but please silence your phones. Uh, we will take your questions from in the room if you raise your hand uh, towards the end, but we'll also take your questions online. You type ccga.live into your browser and we'll take your questions. <clears throat> Finally, please know that the views of the individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Um, as always, we thank our members. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Council membership, I encourage you to sign up for our complimentary No Pressure Council Open House on February 27th. Uh, the details are on our website. Um, so now it's my pleasure to welcome this evening's panel, drawn uh, from across the Midwest and conveniently in geographical order. Um, from in the east, in, from Michigan, we have John Austin. Uh, John is a non-resident senior fellow uh, on the Global Midwest at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and he's the director of the Michigan Economic Center. In these roles, uh, John focuses on economic transformation in the Midwest, um, and John also served for 16 years on the Michigan State Board of Education. Next to John, we have Shia Kapos. She is, as many of you know, she's the author of Politico's Illinois Playbook, an indispens indispensable newsletter covering government and politics in Chicago and Illinois. Uh, prior to joining Politico, uh, she wrote the popular Taking Notes column for the Chicago Sun-Times, and she also wrote for Crane's Business. Um, next to Shia is, is Molly Beck from Wisconsin. Uh, she is the state government and politics reporter for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Uh, previously, Molly was the capital reporter for the Wisconsin State Journal, and she's been a reporter at the State Register the State Journal Register in Springfield, Illinois, and the Owatonna People's Press in Minnesota. Um, and from Iowa, we have Robert Leonard. Robert is the host of a daily public affairs program for KNIA KRLS Public Radio, located in South Central Iowa in the towns of Knoxville, Pella, and Indianola. He has covered the Iowa primaries during this and previous cycles and has met uh, many, almost all, of the men and women vying to be president. Um, his work features in various national news outlets, and he comments frequently on Iowan politics and rural politics. Um, and he'll be selling, we'll, we will be selling copies of Robert's new book, Deep Midwest, Midwestern Explorations, uh, after this evening's program from our partners at the bookseller. Finally, to moderate, we're pleased to welcome back Adam Roberts. Adam is the Midwest's correspondent for The Economist, the, the Midwest correspondent for The Economist, and writes on politics, policy, and social affairs in the United States. Um, he spent much of the last few weeks in Iowa as well. Um, before he got the Midwest beat, Adam was in Paris, and before that, he was um, the Economist bureau chief in Delhi. Um, he's the author of India, Superfast Primetime Ultimate Nation, which was published in 2017. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming our panelists. Great. Well, well hello, everyone. I'm glad you all made it out on a snowy night like tonight. Um, I think we should begin the discussion because it's on everyone's mind. We've just had New Hampshire and we just had the Iowa caucuses by focusing a little bit on the Democratic race, because I think that's kind of what's on top of my mind, at least. And I want to turn to Bob, because you're from Iowa, uh, and just put this to you, that the only part of the world I've ever seen an election process as crazy as the one I saw in Iowa a couple of weeks ago was in Uganda about <laughs> 20 years ago, where in a village election, people were told to line up, and the longest queue was the winner. The longest line was the winner. So it seemed to me that this weird thing that was going on in Iowa would be nice and exotic and strange, but it would at least work. And I got there a week ago, and, and there was chaos. So, Bob, you know everything about Iowa. What went wrong? Well, I'm still trying to sort through it with, uh, I don't know, a level head in the sense that we've done this for 40 years, and we're pretty good at it, and something went wrong. Uh, one of the things that we have to look at, though, is I think is what went right, um, and then also what went wrong. I, I stood at a, at a, I went to a couple of precincts as a, as a media observer, and I was standing in behind uh, Megan, my friend, who was doing the tallies, and Jan, another friend, was doing the counts. And they got all the counts. 71 of uh, people were there. I knew almost all of them. And as Megan was entering the data, she looked at Jan and she said on her phone, it's not working. 
And then she turned to me and she said, it's not working. Okay, and so then, you know, I went to another one, I went to uh, other ones and other friends were leading them. And some of them got through, for some of them the apps worked. Um, one of the things that we need to recognize is that, and I'll try not to go on too long about this, but from on the ground, it worked. And what, what the media isn't reporting is what the precinct captains were taught. They were taught, here's the app, use the app. If the app doesn't work, use the phone line. The phone line was hit by Trump supporters, by CNN, the media, clogging the phone lines. So the phone lines didn't work. Then they were told to photograph and email them. And then if that didn't work, to drive them into the county seat. And so there was backup after backup after backup after backup. And ultimately it worked that we have results, but it didn't work in terms of how the media wanted it to work. And by the time I got home, Brian Williams and Rachel Maddow were going nuts. Yeah. It was an absolute failure, it's a disaster, and so the media just piled on when in terms of par uh, party building, winnowing the field, we had 24, 25 candidates. We gave America five. So we did our job. <laughs> there was a pa Fortunately, there was a paper trail. We just didn't get the results as fast. Adam, can I, no, I This in? is great, because what I want to have is tension and confrontation on the panel, so John. <laughs> I, no, I, I want to chime in on behalf of Iowa. It is so oh. um, tragic and unfortunate that the, the image of Iowans that now the world has seen is actually the opposite of the truth. I was always reassured uh, that Iowans were going first. I cut my teeth right out of college, losing two counties for Walter Mondale in 1984. Uh, and then I worked for Mike Dukakis uh, when he ran for president and was out there a lot. And Iowans I found to be the most um, thoughtful, informed. I mean, the, the farming community knows more about the international scene than most Americans. Uh, and Iowans generally, they're very well read, highly rates of literacy. They have a great statewide paper that actually, I hope it still does, covers the world. So I was very happy, always thank goodness Iowans are, are doing this first because they actually uh, take time and are thoughtful about it. Well, we can't have everyone Plus, in paper. Shia, can give us the Illinois view. Yeah, I don't think it's fair to pile on the media. I mean, I know there is a problem with instant gratification. We think we have to have the results right away. Um, but even the chads in Florida, we probably got the results day one or two, right? I think that's when, <laughs> you know, it was really slow. But M Molly or Shia, would either of you say it's time for Iowa to give up on being first? Whatever method they use, and a, a more demographically uh, representative state, such as Illinois, right. or, or Wisconsin right. maybe, uh, should, should go because of more non-white voters, more, you know, more of the mix that's typical of America. There's certainly people calling for that. I know the governor of Wisconsin, he's a Democrat, and he almost immediately, he doesn't take many controversial stances, but he, he said that he wants, he doesn't want Iowa to be first anymore. He doesn't like the caucuses. Um, he didn't make a pitch for Wisconsin to be first, but. <laughs> Illinois did. Not after what happened yeah, right. to Iowa. Right. Illinois made the pitch. <laughs> yeah. Maybe no one will want to go first. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, Illinois does want to go first, but I imagine, um, and you probably know better, obviously. Um, would Iowa switch to a primary as opposed to caucuses? I could see that happening before Iowa is abandoned completely. Yeah, I don't know. It's, there's going to be people making this decision, and I don't know what they're going to do. They're going to sit down with the people in New Hampshire. I know that. If you didn't hear it, the chair of the, uh, of the Democratic Party, Troy Price, who um, led this effort, who's a friend of mine, he resigned today. So he's gone. Um, and the thing that's important for everybody to realize is Troy Price isn't the Democratic Party. The leadership of the Democratic Party in Iowa isn't the Democratic Party. Tom Perez isn't the Democratic Party. Megan and Ann and Russ and Annie, my friends that were running those caucuses and that were largely successful, they are the Democratic Party. And heads should roll but the party is the people. It's not the leadership. We don't elect them. We don't have anything to do with them. Leadership failed. But then see, if we're in a time where there's suspicions about the election process, and the, I'm not gonna blame all the media because a lot of it was responsible, especially the print media was responsible. <laughs> the broadcast media was, it was pretty outrageous. 
and, and it's they're undermining the electoral process if they're hysterical. The new normal has to be paper documentation, and it's not going to be fast, and we have to be prepared for that. I, I'm sure I think a bunch of journalists are up here attacking the media. Yeah. I think this is, this is over the top. I, I think that my, my worry after watching Iowa, if I were a Democrat, is not just about the process. It's about the low turnout, the fact that it wasn't... I was told a week before the caucus that they were expecting... The Democratic organisers were expecting a turnout similar to 2008 when Barack Obama was, was the winner. And instead, you had a turnout among Democrats that was more typical of 2016. So you're not seeing the level of enthusiasm for Democrats generally as, as you might have expected, given how much Trump is disliked. Would you, any of you on the panel, worry that the Democrats are fumbling this? Well, I worry for two different reasons. One, it, it kind of gives Trump definite ammunition to say, these Democrats, as he is, are weak, the gang that can't shoot straight, I'm the strong one even though you know, some of us don't see that as he does. But also, and I think Robert and I were talking, it, it can, if anything, make things worse for people in Iowa who are feeling like the East Coast elites and the international pinhead elites and media are now making fun of us. And that just feeds the kind of resentment about those who are not from here, are the elites, are the coastal people who are, you know, and that can add, you know, steam uh, to the kind of Trumpian uh, outlook. I think it invites criticism from within the Democrat, excuse me, Democratic Party, just about the whole idea of a caucus. Do, do most people have three hours they can spend on a Monday night to go down to a gymnasium and, yeah. and you know spend some time? I, I think there's been a lot of uh, Democrats who have criticized that process, and this gave them an opportunity to do that publicly. Okay. Maybe we should move and, and talk a little bit about the people who came out of, of Iowa. You talked about Iowa doing the job of reducing the field to five, although that seems like a pretty big field, even, even so. Um, we've had a question that's come in that was a question I was going to ask anyway, but which of the Democratic candidates do you think has the best chance of a, being an appealing figure for the Midwest? We've got at least two in Amy Klobuchar and, and Pete Buttigieg who are from this region. Maybe you count Joe Biden as having a connection to the Midwest as well. Is there any particular candidate that you feel from your reporting and experience in your states would resonate the best? Um, Molly, do you want to begin? Yeah, in Wisconsin, um, I'm not sure he'll make it to Wisconsin, but uh, former v Vice President Joe Biden has been very popular in Wisconsin um, among Democratic voters. I know that Republicans are worried about him, especially in the Milwaukee suburbs, which is historically been very strong for them, but under President Trump has not been as strong. Um, I, I think Pete, Mayor Pete Buttigieg is very, um, somebody that Republicans are worried about too, or Amy Klobuchar, if, if she rises to that you know, position by April, our, our primary, primaries in April. Um, I know that Mad Madison is, is very liberal. It's different than Democrats everywhere mm -hmm. else in in uh, Wisconsin, and I would expect Bernie Sanders to be really popular there again too. So popular in Madison, yeah, yeah, yeah among Democrats. Yeah. So it's 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 been so far been Biden and, and Sanders as the top two in Wisconsin. And I think Chicago, um, depending on your demographic, I think if you are an older African American in Chicago, you might like Joe Biden. But you're a, if you're younger. Uh, African American or otherwise, young people are gravitating towards Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And then there's uh, big support for Mayor Pete because he's our neighbor and he has a, a, a large support among the gay community here and young people and moderates. So I don't know about Amy Klobuchar. She has a smaller following here, though there are people who are behind her and campaigning for her in both um, f from Illinois who have gone to Iowa and New Hampshire, so. I think it, um, it depends what your theory of the case is. I know whether you think the turnout and excitement can drive uh, the vote or whether, and we're only, the stakes are even higher because we're really only talking three or four states. My state, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, maybe some others. So. Uh, or do you need a, a centrist populist or someone who can appeal to kind of working class whites uh, and not scare off 
you know, independents and professionals and business people with, you know, socialism or Medicare for all. I know people forget um, in Wisconsin and Michigan, I believe, last time, the election, uh, it wasn't so much that Trump won and mobilized all these people. It, he got less votes than Mitt Romney did four years prior in my state. It was that nobody came out to vote for Hillary. Nobody came out to vote for Hillary. I lost my re-election to the state board by 6,000 out of 2 million votes. And it's like, since no one knew me, it's like a proxy for party voting. And usually uh, I would be carried to victory if, if any Democrats, African Americans, young people, anybody had gotten excited to come out to vote. But I'm really nervous because there are people in our, Bernie won the primary against Hillary because he appealed a lot to both, yes, young people and excitement and change the world, but also a lot of the working class labor guys, you know, they are angry at being ripped off and, and the, the working class being screwed, you know, in their view. And so they respond to someone like Bernie and, you know, would, would a Amy Klobuchar or a moderate uh, appeal to um, a broader base or would Bernie mobilize everybody? I just don't know. And I don't, I'm, believe me, I'm trying to figure it out because I have a certain hopes for the election. And we haven't talked about Mike Bloomberg either. I mean, he's yeah. campaigning nonstop here in Illinois, so I could see him having an impact. Before we move away from Mayor Pete, I mean, I have a particular interest in him. I've just written a profile about him. I've been following him for a year or two. He does strike me as a really historic character. I mean, would you have imagined 10 years ago an openly gay man could have been, you know, in effect, the winner of Iowa's caucus and number two in New Hampshire's primary? Um, is this something that we're sort of casting into, into, the, into the shadows when actually it's a historical breakthrough moment? It's a big deal. I mean, if you think that he's really only been on the scene a year and Bernie Sanders has been working for this position for five years or more and, and Mayor Pete has come in and, and swooped in and is virtually tied. I mean, even New Hampshire, mm. uh, I think they both got nine uh, electoral votes. So yeah. it's amazing. But in Iowa, for example, would you have imagined 10 years ago that a gay candidate could have done so well? No. I would have never imagined it. Our, our society has changed in a profound way, and uh, for the better, I think. Uh, he's a very interesting guy when you sit down and talk with him. He's uh, really engaged. A lot of times when I interview a presidential candidate, they want to be done with me and on. He wants to sit and chat. And he's very personable. He's, uh, he's just a good guy. He's very thoughtful. I think people admire that. I would have never imagined it. And he can, in uh, rallies, he can really appeal to people. It's just, there's something about being on the ground and watching these people work that is just so incredible. And, and he's, he's just pretty remarkable. I know that he has lots of problems in the African American community. That's a concern. It has to be a concern. We'll see if he can build those bridges. But I don't know. He's a remarkable candidate. And I have to say, with respect to Iowa's progressive past, I'm going to say we brought forth Barack Obama. And in this election, we brought forth two women, a Jewish man, and a gay guy. And that's pretty darn <laughs> progressive, if you ask me. I, I want to do a quick survey of the room, since we've got a bunch of potential voters in here. Could, who thinks that Mayor Pete could be president after this election cycle? Anyone in this room think he could do it? No? What do you think, about a third of the room thinks it's yeah, possible? I think this is evidence to, he's got a pretty um, powerful and compelling message in person, which he articulates in a, in a different way. I was hearing the role of God and faith in his life. He talks about in a different way that's much better than others. He talks about even his, his gayness in a way that is yeah. understandable and relatable and human, but also principled. I think the, the concerns are not, I don't think people are concerned about inexperience really, because we always go with the up and comer, but it's more, there's a bit of um, uh, apparent, apparent calculation and somewhat very careful machining of his career, including the military service, et cetera, perhaps. And, and also, if you're a local official, you're in physical human touch with your community. And the fact that he is not loved by the African American community in South Bend doesn't speak well, because that should be job one, is being there with them. And it's certainly them. a problem for the forthcoming yeah. primary states. So we, well, we've talked quite a lot about the Democratic side of this, and I'm sure we'll come back to it with questions. But we've also got to think about the other side. And I want to pick on something that John just said about turnout in, or enthusiasm for Trump in 2016 was actually quite low. I wonder if you, any of you on the panel, from your view of your states, 
I think enthusiasm for the incumbent has actually gone up a lot in the last three or four years or not. Because I'm struck going to rallies that the president has, such as in Milwaukee recently, but also seeing attitudes on the economy and the historical fact that if you're the incumbent when the economy is doing well, unemployment is so low, you should probably win very easily. So what's the evidence, do you think, from the ground of how popular Trump will be in 2020? I, in 2016, Wisconsin had uh, the lowest turnout it had had in 20 years, I think. And um, usually Wisconsin has really good turnout in presidential years. Um, and that year, there were a lot of Republicans who did not like Donald Trump, a lot of, quote, never Trumpers. Um, and that has changed a lot since 2016. Um, virtually all of the Republicans who were publicly criticizing Donald Trump in Wisconsin have not, they now praise him and they like the economy. They really like the Supreme Court uh, justices. So um, there are arguments there that are aside from uh, the personality that have turned off a lot of voters in the Milwaukee suburbs, for example. Um, but I, I have noticed that, that there's, there's just a lot, you know, former Governor Scott Walker, for example, he, when he was running for president against Donald Trump, he, when he got out in 2015, he said he was, he was ending his campaign so somebody could coalesce around a candidate that could um, prevent Donald Trump from being president. And now he is one of Donald Trump's biggest supporters. So, so your hunch in Wisconsin is that Trump will be able to get a higher turnout this year than he did in 2016? I, w I would think so, just because of there's there's more Republican enthusiasm for yeah. him this time around. Bob, would you say the same in Iowa? My rep in, in my county, twice as many people voted for Donald Trump as Hillary Clinton, and if anything, their support has has solidified. There, there, there's even more support because there were some people that were equivocal about him but still voted for him. What th that my friends see in Trump that are Republicans is a guy who is a wrecking ball, and they love his personal characteristics because they want that wrecking ball to, you know, to break all norms and traditions and anything that they want to, to end the liberal stranglehold that the liberals have on society, everything from their perspective on, on uh, religion, uh, the family, gay marriage, education, you name it. Uh, they love everything that he does, and they don't care what he does. He used to say that I can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue, and they wouldn't, you know, think anything bad about him. That's true. That's true. They want him, and, and it's grown, and, and it's become more cult-like. And and it, uh, and one the last rally I went to, he could weave truths, half truths, hyperbole, lies all together, and it didn't matter. It doesn't matter, and it's it's and it's building, and it's growing in my community. And just to focus on Iowa one more time on this, and then come to maybe Illinois, would that be true among farmers who are suffering with the, the problems they're having with sending their soybeans to China and so on? Would they also be sticking to Trump because they like his wrecking ball behavior? Yeah, and one of the things that people don't understand that say, well, these farmers aren't voting in their economic self-interest. For many of my Republican friends, they see it as voting in their spiritual self-interest uh, because of the judges, because of abortion. Abortion is the number one item for them. And, if, and th it doesn't matter what he does. It's just all about abortion. Now, he's talking about ending the farm payments. If he ends those farm payments, that, if kept, that hasn't even kept them whole, but keeps them from you know, going totally under, then things might change. Shia, what's your view? Well, I'm looking at 2018 when um, there were, you know, suburban white women came out and turned two districts that were longtime Republican uh, representative districts to be Democrat, Lauren Underwood and Sean Caston. And I think you're going to see that uh, continue. I don't know if it's enough to... Um, counter Donald Trump, because he is still really popular, but there, uh, there are uh, suburban white women uh, didn't come out for Hillary, and they realized that they should have, or maybe, because now they're complaining that they, uh, they don't support Donald Trump. So, so that changed in 2018. I don't know what it'll do uh, in 2020. 
on the view? I, I have no doubt that nationally there's a pretty large majority that's eager to go out and kind of end the madness and the destruction of our role in the world and the embarrassment uh, that we're facing and the damage being done, frankly, to a lot of people and our reputation. But again, it's back to our three or four states. And you know, my understanding of Michigan is um, we, the, the, the people who live in communities that aren't what they used to be, that are, are hollowed out and there's not jobs and the kids have gone. Uh, these are the working class whites who fled the small industrial cities like Flint and Saginaw, but live outside in the suburbs or in the exurbs. That's the Trump voter. And we're seeing when people are found economic purchase, when, they're, when their community is doing better and they themselves are doing okay, and are not worried about you know, that uh, daily anxiety or anger, because there used to be good jobs at good wages in most of these communities. So in West Michigan, which is highly Republican, you saw it vote for Gretchen Whitmer, our Democratic governor, because people have psychic space to be thoughtful and professionals, uh, Republican women, independents, moderates, business people are like, yeah, I'm going to go with the person who's going to do the things that are important topics, roads, you know, education, and I'm not responding to this kind of nostalgia for the past. Bring back the good old days, and let's blame others for somehow a life not being what it should be, immigrants and people of color, which is very strong in many of our communities still. Um, so that's why I'm so like manic to, can we accelerate economic good things to more people and places? Because then people are able to be reflective and they vote thoughtfully, um, I'm not saying it's understandable why people are feeling under stress and angry and a little bitter, and then they respond to talk tough, we're going to deliver, even though it isn't delivery that's actually happening. The places that are worse off, the manufacturing communities, are worse off under Trump, but they're probably more likely to vote for him. So I have this counterfactual uh, understanding. The places that are worse off and struggling in the Midwest, those are the places that are still the strongest for Donald Trump. Places that are economically doing better are voting the right way, like the two counties, two Republican counties flipped to a Democrat. They're the relatively well-off suburban counties around Detroit. Um, and we, we saw 13 counties in 2016 that are big Democratic places that flipped to Trump. And they're the struggling Democratic blue-collar, formerly you know, vital communities that are sprinkled around our state and your state and most of the Midwest. So we've got two theories here. On the one hand, it's a cultural thing. It's voting on the basis of abortion policy or something. The other theory is it's some complicated process with economic growth that early on, maybe, when you're not doing well, you, you might be frustrated and angry and take it out but by I think they go Trump. together, meaning your economic circumstance, when, you're, when you don't have control of your life and it's, it's not uh, as, as, there's not optimism about being able to make it and, and being, feeling good about your own future, that it feeds this kind of anxiety, and particularly when demagogues fuel it, that you know the, the world is changing too fast. You're losing control. I mean, that was the argument in Brexit. That's what's happening in Europe. Uh, the, you're losing control of your life, and job one is having you know a decent income and some predictability, and you're not anxious about that. So that's what's driving. The two go together, and then you're yes, you're in, when you hear about a changing world and black and brown people overrunning us, you know that just makes you even more anxious and resentful and, and eager to kind of lash out. Molly, can I bring it, and then we'll go oh, yeah. to Illinois. On Wisconsin, I, I'm, I'm struck by how important that state could be in, in the presidential race uh, this year, because it's so close and it's such an important one for tipping Trump, Trump over the edge in 2016. Where do you think we should be looking in Wisconsin for, for where the tipping point might be? Are we looking at the south of the state? Are we looking at the suburbs that Shia mentioned? Where would you say that we as interested outsiders should be focusing our attention on this state? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the city of Milwaukee and the Milwaukee suburbs and also western Wisconsin, those are the areas. In western Wisconsin, there was a lot of um, voters who voted for President Obama, and then in 2016, they voted for Trump. Um, in the city of Milwaukee, turnout was very low in 2016. Um, you know, Democrats are trying to figure out how to boost enthusiasm for voting in, in 2020, and that obviously will depend on who the candidate is. Um, and, and also the Milwaukee suburbs, like I mentioned before, um, same story in Wisconsin. There is a, a district that was a very red district. Scott Walker held that seat in the assembly, and now there's a Democratic woman who's pro-choice and wants gun restrictions, you know, total, total opposite of Scott Where Walker. Where is that, Molly? Just in Wauwatosa, 
here is it's right outside of Milwaukee. Um, so I, I think while I said before there's more there might be more Republican enthusiasm for voting for Trump, there might be um, we might see a big shift in the suburbs um, just based on the last couple elections in the state. Um, so you agree with Shia, the sh suburbs are going to be where, as we saw in the midterms, where the battle is, re is really fought. The suburbs, in, but also the city of Milwaukee, because when, when turnout is high in the city of Milwaukee, Democrats win almost every time. And the turnout was low in Milwaukee, especially because the African-American right. vote was low. Right, right. There just wasn't enthusiasm. For and that. is there any indication yet that the African-American vote is going to be higher this year? <laughs> I, I know there's, there's been... Um, Groups created since 2016 just for that purpose, you know. So, that, so there's an effort there. Um, former Attorney General Eric Holder, I think, is is spending money on on groups like that there. So, um, there's there's definitely a recognition that there was a problem there and they could fix it. Um, but again, you know, it, it depends on who the candidate will be. So. Well, I think so. South Carolina, February 29th, is going to give the answer <laughs> about where the black vote is because it is very relative. That state it is indicative of what a lot of the country is. We know that. And so we're finally going to see whether Joe Biden has the African American support that he has said he has and that polls seem to indicate he has. Um, and we'll see whether uh, younger African Americans or younger people are behind Bernie Sanders. At you know, at the same level that they have been the past two uh, races. So uh, I think South Carolina is just the game changer for this whole contest. Really. I'm, I'm going to quote an economist poll, if I can, that came out today, um, which suggests that Joe Biden's support among the African-American community has fallen from 51% to 38% in a week. And uh, that if it continues at that rate, he's toast. I mean, yeah. he has no chance. And well, I said, yeah, I think that will that re that contest will decide whether, you know, whether how to what extent he goes forward. I think. Don't you think? Uh, well, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I think it also underscores that there is a, a new there's a there's a big pragmatic thinking going on uh, among many constituencies. Like what we have to be Donald Trump, and. You know, we always are replaying the last election and trying to draw kind of the tea leaves forward. And most elections like change the rules and the dynamics. This could be one, and I think we're seeing signs of it, where um, everybody's making a calculation as best they can. Who is going to be the strongest to end the madness in November? And that could mean African Americans leaving anybody that they think they support, holding their nose and voting for Bloomberg. I mean, we're seeing, I mean, I, I myself, as a Democrat, am trying to figure this out. What could work best? And if we have a train wreck, continuous train wreck through the primaries, there may be, a, like, yeah, the guy's got billions, he's short, but, like, he could win, and we just have to win, you know, at all costs. We'll all, like, hold our nose and not be angry at each other, and, but just get out there and get somebody who can end the, the madness. Yeah, oh. I think African Americans will um, coalesce behind whoever the Democratic nominee is. The question is, will they be so enthused, like we've all been talking about, where they'll come out in, you know, droves to vote? Mm -hmm. And there was a—I heard an interview. Chastity Pratt Dawson is a reporter in Detroit, and they had a, several African American journalists and others on the radio, you know, talking about this question: Is the 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 momentum, at least some progress forward and some new revelations like we've always had in forced segregation and housing and you know, the black community has been purposefully kept out of opportunity for years and maybe we're beginning to acknowledge it, but now we're having this kind of um, you know, big giant step backward of attack on them and the tendency for the African American community, we cannot like despair. You know, we've always lived with hope against the odds. Like we have got to somehow not despair, but it's some some may be despairing. You know, oh my God, we're under assault again for our lives, and and how are we going to get excited to go out there and and end the agency that's causing that? Let me just take a little step back because we've talked a huge amount about the presidential election, and I think that's the thing that's on everyone's mind. And and it may be that you will all tell me. That's the only thing that matters. People are all thinking about how to get rid of Donald Trump, and that's all they care about. But 2020 also Except has, for the people that like him. Except for the ones who like him. But 2020 sure. also has congressional elections, state elections, senatorial elections. Are we missing important things in our discussion, but also in our general debate about where the 2020 election is going? Are there trends and, and forces 
pushing voters to say, well, actually, as much as I don't like the madness, as you call it, John, I'm quite happy with the economy, or I'm quite happy with other things that are happening in policy terms. Are we getting too focused on the presidential election and neglecting these other bits of it? I think it's the only thing. It's the only <laughs> thing that people care about. Well, and, and <laughs> let's, if, if the Republicans lose some seats in the Senate, you know, that turns the whole thing on its head immediately, and if Trump is beaten. I was really frustrated with the media coverage of the whole impeachment, impeachment, what are the senators going to do? Can the Democrats make their case? Unless and until um, the, the political calculation for a senator is, I'm not going to get primaried out of existence uh, if I support, go against Donald Trump, but I'm going to lose my job if I don't go the right way and, and, and vote for him or against him, I mean, it's a total political calculation. And, and they'll all turn on a dime if some senators lose their job because of Donald Trump. I mean, So it's that, all from the top down. That, that guides everything. It's, it's all politics. And whether you're going to keep your job, your big, important, high-paid, you know, prestigious job that you don't have to do anything. Uh, and for some of them, there are many people committed public servants. But for most of them, they just want to keep that role. And they are making the calculation every day. Am I going to lose my role if I go this way, or am I going to keep it if I go this way? Except for Mitt Romney, I guess. And he has his own political standing in the state, thank God, by being you know, a legendary Romney. So he has the space to do it. Plus, he probably doesn't like Donald Trump very much. Right. Now, I want to, to bring in, since we're at the Council on Global Affairs, I want to bring in just one question on, on foreign policy. Because I'm also struck, when I go around to rallies and to campaigns, that people do talk about uh, America's place in the world. And at the Milwaukee rally that I think both Molly and I attended when Trump was, was boasting about the assassination of Soleimani that had happened not long beforehand, the, the crowd was very excited about this, mm -hmm. uh, this killing. How much do you think foreign policy is an issue that voters care about? Is it something that is significant when it comes to who the Democrats will go for in the end? Do international affairs matter in a US presidential election, or are they kind of bottom of a list of 25 topics? Bob, what's the view in Iowa? Well, um, it depends on who you are. If I don't think that most people know a lot about international affairs. And I'm going to be critical of the media again, because the only place I learn about international affairs, not the only place, but where I really learn about international affairs is in the afternoon when I listen to the BBC. I hope you read The Economist as well. I read The Economist. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. But it's, it's the BBC and The Economist and The Guardian, I mean, and other things. But really, the American media doesn't cover a lot of foreign affairs. And my Republican friends think we're top dogs. We've been with suckers all along. And so he will, here we will continue. Uh, so Trump's doing a great job. My Democratic friends are, you know, they're all upset about it. But... I don't think that they know a lot more about foreign affairs. I think we're pretty ignorant about foreign affairs as a whole. Would that be the view of the panel, that foreign affairs is not really a, a top issue? I, th I think it is, depending on who you are. In Wisconsin, um, you know, dairy farmers are really struggling. I think the state is um, leading the nation again in farm bankruptcies and um, how tariffs are affecting that situation and just kind of suffocating the farmers. I think that, you know, that's going to be on their minds, you know, and, and whether that will play into how they vote, we don't know yet. But I know that that's something that's, um, you know, every, we cover that a lot on, in, mm. at the Journal Sentinel, actually. Um, and also a couple years ago when there was, you know, Donald Trump was fighting with Harley Davidson, which is a very important Milwaukee brand about the steel tariffs and how that was affecting their company and they were going to outsource some some work there because of that and so those issues I mean they they're there and yeah. I, I think also with um, there was some polling about how Wisconsin voters feel about um, how the president is handling foreign policy and it, it looks like they generally don't like his approach to foreign policy but overall his job approval is split you know it's yeah. I think 48 percent approve and 49 percent don't so 76 percent of farmers do it's the last yeah. poll I saw right well, so I think Illinois farmers, I mean, Illinois leads the country in soybean production. And those farmers know about the China tariffs. They know that uh, exports have slowed down to the point, prices have dropped, it's affect their production dramatically. So 
you know, they do, they are clued in. Um, maybe not on everything, but. I want to do, they know, do they know where Ukraine is? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I w we're, we're getting to the stage where we're going to take questions from the room. So if, if you've got questions, be ready to ask them. I've also got a pile of questions coming in on, on the iPad. So clearly people are excited by this. But, but John, do you want to come in on the foreign policy? Yes. Um, and I always read The Economist when I'm quoted by you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, for some people, and probably many in the audience, um, who observe and are really chagrined at you know what's gone on where we're you know we're not providing the leadership in the world we're walking away from leadership on climate change we're blowing up the international alliances with our allies the kind of destructive and and really abdicating American leadership on on the good stuff like we should be as always the place that welcomes immigrants and is the chief refugee destination it's what made us great but I think for, for on other dimensions it's sort of for some. Um, I appreciate the tough talk on China. China is a great whipping boy uh, and boogeyman for um, things that are hitting us that are making our lives not what they should be or trade, you know. And, and the tough talk is, is attractive to, to many on, on fronts like that. So I think it's, it, it depends on certain topics. Others um, are, are happy about, you know, what he's doing in the Middle East because, you know, he's like he's a tough, tough guy, you know. And so that's... That appeals, and so on different topics. I did hear Alyssa Slotkin, this Republic or Democratic Congresswoman who won a Republican seat. She said there were two times during her re her short years as a Congressperson that her constituents, who are Trump voters, um, really said to her, "I don't like what he's doing." One was he had the meeting with Vladimir Putin, and one when there's you know immigrant kids in cages. Uh, those are the two times she heard from her constituents, wait a minute, that's just gone too far. So there is a line that even Donald Trump can step over. Now, I've got two questions on here that are uh, by far and away the most popular questions. So I want, I'm not quite sure who to put them to, but one is an intriguing one to me, and I have no idea what the answer is, but it's about the state of Ohio. Ohio used to be the... I'm not, when I was growing up, it was always Ohio that was the swing state. It was always where elections were, were going to be decided. We obviously don't have anyone from Ohio on the panel today, but maybe, John, <laughs> you're, you're the closest. But... Why is Ohio not the most important state anymore in presidential elections? What have the Democrats done wrong, and why have they lost it? Or, I mean, maybe others of you on the panel. And I've been I've been puzzling the same thing. I think um, perhaps. Uh, and did everyone, anyone read Hillbilly Elegy? Uh, you know, JT, he's from, like, I grew up in West Virginia, and so many people are like his story and his family. They came north, they came to Ohio and Michigan to work in the machine shops and the mills and the mines. Ohio has even more of those, uh, and Indiana and Michigan are probably the densest pack of small and medium and large older factory towns, many of which have lost their anchors, and many of the voters who are still there uh, around those towns, because all of them, like, have a uh, a segregated uh, uh, white flight that left their small urban cores. And those voters, they have more people in places who are this kind of um, prone to nostalgia, mm -hmm. uh, eager to hear we're going to bring back the good old days, and eager to kind of uh, respond to resentment politics. Somebody's getting yours, the immigrants, you know, that you're not getting, no one's paying attention to you. Mm -hmm. And so there, that's my theory, it may be wrong. There are lots of parts of Ohio that are thriving. I mean, all the Columbus area, you know, all the university towns, which we have more in the Midwest than any place, are just killing it. Uh, but there's more of these small and oversized manufacturing towns there where these white working class folks are understandably not happy. But then is Ohio a forerunner of what we're going to see in other parts of the Midwest, do you think? I don't know. I mean, Michigan, Wisconsin is probably more rural and less, has more of the rural hinterland. Michigan has, I think, a larger population of diverse, well, that's not true. I'm, I mean, I'm trying to figure this out, uh, what, what it means that Ohio is now that way. OK, and the, well, now another question has come up to the top of my list, and it's a funny one, so I've got to mention it. Uh, Molly, you were at the rally in Milwaukee, and I was there too, when Donald Trump went off on a rather strange rant about showers, taps, <laughs> dishwashers. And, yeah. and I thought, actually, it was quite clever campaigning, because the next morning, I was back here in Chicago, and I was unpacking our dishwasher at home, and there was a bit of dirt on one of the plates, and I thought, Trump was right! <laughs> you know, it actually was true. And so somehow he got into my brain. So what was that about? Are Wisconsinites particularly concerned about water, or what was it that he was, <laughs> I mean, he was channeling? I think he's, he, he likes to talk about the good old days, and, and he wants, you know, I, I think he's tapping into um, 
maybe trying to tell voters, like, I'm not going to let the government take away your light bulbs, you know, the light bulbs that you like, or yeah. I'm going to make sure the dishwashers work like they used to, or whatever <laughs> it is, you know. Yeah. I, I, to me, that's what I heard when he was talking about that. Um, but, yeah, that was... That was interesting. And actually, that wasn't the first time he had done that, apparently, because right. I thought it was. And so it wasn't <laughs> specially for Wisconsin. Right, it was not it. Wisconsin, okay. yeah. I like the way you said tapping in. That was very good. Um, uh, and then the other question that's burning, I don't know if it's from the audience here or from elsewhere, is about the Hispanic vote. And maybe this is a chance also to touch on, touch on the subject of immigration. So what will the role, do you think, of Hispanic voters be in this election? Because... The common thing to say about the Latino Hispanic vote is it's getting bigger and bigger. It's always going to be decisive. It's going to have a much bigger role to play. And then we always look back at previous elections and say, well, actually, turnout was very low. They didn't really have a very big impact after all. And it's going to be in the future that they will matter as a voting bloc. Shia, do you have any well, view of? In Chicago, that is a constant discussion every election. Uh, Latinos make up a third of the population of Chicago. When it comes time to vote, it is the lowest voting. You know, it's like the youth vote. Nobody goes out to vote. So um, I, it'll be a challenge again. You know, I, I don't know if there will be, there might be a contingent that is uh, inspired and emboldened because of the immigration issues, uh, but there are also uh, segments of the Latino community that are very conservative, so they are Trump supporters too. So, uh, I think my guess is it's similar to the African American community in that for most I would say it's pretty vivid, like that their immigrant communities and Latinos are being terrorized by this administration, yeah. Yeah. Um, and whether they'll be slinking into the shadows in fear or whether they'll be newly out there in numbers to help you know, change the direction of the country and be mobilized to do that. But it literally has been terrorizing our legal immigrant community through ICE raids and all this stuff. It's so horrifying and it's so damaging to human beings, and those communities feel it. And you know, they're not, people aren't stupid. They know what's going on. Are there any questions in the room by hand? Yeah, so we have a couple of microphones doing the round. I, I see a hand here at the front. Uh, so let's take a question here at the front. If you could identify yourself and, and keep the question short, if you can. Hello, good evening. My name is uh, Wolfgang Mössing. I'm the German Consul General. And I have two questions, but short. As long as they're short. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is basically towards Wisconsin and Iowa. I have learned that there is a huge issue on voter registration, voter suppression. In Iowa, it's about former felons. In Wisconsin, it's about people who have moved recently, not re-registered. I don't know whether there are any similar issues in other states like Michigan. But is that an important issue? Does that make... Uh, a big difference in a tight outcome like it was in Wisconsin, like it was in Michigan. And the second question is, as somebody just moved into the United States last year, so pretty recently, something that I don't understand, that um, the conservatives are only always complaining about the whole system is biased towards the liberals. But if you look, Bush won with the majority, or with the minority vote. Trump won with the minority vote. The Senate is basically completely lopsided when it comes to population. The Electoral College is lopsided when it comes to population. Why does it, do the Democrats not uh, succeed in convincing that this is absolutely complete rubbish to say that the system is actually <laughs> biased towards the conservative, towards the liberals, when it is really lopsided towards the conservatives? Thank you. Well, good luck with that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on, on voter suppression, maybe Molly, you wanted to. I mean, I saw that uh, sure. very interesting report about the attempt to remove a lot of voters from yeah. roles. Yeah, that's been a big issue in Wisconsin. Um, there's a law in Wisconsin that says if you've moved, you have to um, re register. And if you don't, after a certain amount of time, the law says that the elections, that state elections officials, have to remove you from the voter rolls. Um, there is a conservative legal firm that is suing the Elections Commission because they haven't done this, because they don't believe that these people actually have moved and they don't want to do this until after the election, um, the April election. Um, and the reason why both Republicans and Democrats are really interested in this is because every it seems like every election in Wisconsin is decided by like 20,000 votes. I think 
-hmm. Donald Trump won in 2016 by 27,000 votes, and um, Governor Tony Evers beat Scott Walker, and I think it, I, it was 15,000 votes or 50,000 votes yeah. or something like that. So um, when you're talking about, I, I believe the numbers around 200,000 voters taking out taking them off the voter rolls, and um, my paper did an analysis, and most of those voters were living in. Um, areas that tend to be more democratic. Um, but also, if they moved, they do need, need to re-register. And they can't re-register when you vote at the polls. So I think there's a little bit of hyperbole going on on both sides about this situation. But it, but that's why it's, it's a big deal, because every election is so close in Wisconsin. It is it relevant in other states, this attempt to keep Definitely. people off the You want to talk about poll? Iowa, Bob? Yeah, it's, it's relevant in the sense it's happening. But uh, Republicans have the House and the Senate and the governorship, and they'll, they'll move, they'll restrict voting hours. They're slowly you know, moving the target, and it's ending up suppressing votes, but it's cast in terms of, of voter protection, protecting the integrity of the system. And uh, so there's minor bursts of Democratic protests that don't go anywhere. I was gonna say, I mean, certainly the electoral map uh, is, you know, is, is um, conservatively held or republicanly held and kind of rigged that way. Um, there are more blue voters in the nation. They're just not spread out around the country. And the whipping of the media, you know, and blaming the media and is, is just a it's, a, it's a way to, you know, signal that these these elites, these others uh, are, are part of what's out to get you and don't understand your way of life to kind of rally, you know, the folks who are feeling that their way of life is, uh, you know, is, is not understood by the coastal people and the media. But I think the yeah, voter suppression, I mean, there's a very, I used to think when Hillary Clinton said there's a vast right wing conspiracy, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, right. There is, meaning there's a very organized effort to disenfranchise voters who are going to vote Democratic or more likely to, from the census question to all the changing of the voting rules in North Carolina. Uh, and it's very organized and it's having too much impact. But even in Michigan, you know, there was the Russians and the agency to try to depress the African American turnout was very real on social media yeah. to try to question Hillary. And it may have been the difference. We lost Michigan by 12,000 votes. Uh, and, and we have a huge African American population that. 400,000 fewer voted uh, for Hillary than Obama. So, you know, that was successful. If we won Michigan or Wisconsin, we'd be having a different, you know, conversation here fundamentally. I, I want to take another couple of questions. Let's have a question from the back of the room. The gentleman there with his, his hand up. Thank you. My name is John Volk. Uh, the uh, turnout in New Hampshire yesterday was uh, the highest it's ever been about 20% higher than in 2008. And um, there was a column in the New York Times this morning saying that uh, Bernie Sanders is unelectable and what are the Democrats gonna do about it? And I was wondering in your states uh, if you think that uh, the turnout may, may come back in 2020 and um, whether you think Bernie is electable. Do you mean that if Bernie is the nominee, will the turnout be high? Well, number one, will the turnout be high? And number two, if T Bernie prevails, is he going to be able to win against Trump? OK, does anyone have a, an opinion about that? Well, let me talk about the voter um, turnout. There's been much to be said about the Iowa turnout being lower. We were expecting a high turnout. And so you know, a lot of hand-wringing about that. But in uh, the Des Moines metro, it was up. And the, we've got a really good chair in Polk County, Sean Bagnuski, who's really organized and turnout was really up in those very important suburbs, too. Um, in the more rural counties, it was still flat. But if you talk to people and you went, you went around and listened to the door knockers talking to people, people were just happy with anybody. They didn't need to caucus. They wouldn't just, just get behind whoever. And so I think, I think there's a lot of energy. I think there's too much hand-wringing about that, that there will be a surge with respect to uh, voter turnout. Um, but let me press it a bit, because that was specifically a question about Bernie Sanders. And he's not your typical Democrat candidate. He's more like a George McGovern in the early 70s, or someone who's not until recently even identified as a Democrat. He's a democratic socialist. He wants to take away people's private health insurance. Mm. Do you really think that moderate Democrats are going to be excited about turning out for Bernie Sanders? No. No. <laughs> 
I, I, it, I doesn't seem like well, it's me. But he's he's different. He does he does speak to a segment that of the same Trump voter, the blue collar working right. class white guy, who uh, is feeling yeah we're getting screwed and soak the rich and you know we're going to throw over the apple cart. Um, and I think again, it's sort of what's your theory of the case in a place like Michigan? Uh, could a Bernie mobilize a lot of? Uh, there's a lot of pent up voting demand generally on the Democratic side to just go out and vote. You could feel it in the midterms. I mean, feel it. So whether that's going to be there and Bernie could turn out a lot of people, including a few people that went for Trump that wouldn't go for Hillary, or whether that's too dangerous. And I can know a lot of people who want to vote for an Amy Klobuchar or someone who like is sane. You know, and it's not going to fall down uh, on the job. And who, you know, business people, professional people, like, okay, but they don't want Bernie Sanders because they really think, you know, and that he's not, it's all a screed, and it's even a dangerous screed um, if he were to do some of it. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. I'd like to take a question from a, from a woman. There's a question there, please. Hi, I'm Amy Hand. Um, I'm, I'm sometimes struck by the similarities of the Republican field of candidates from 2016, which is very large and kind of got winnowed down gradually in the run-up to the final election. Is that an apt comparison to the very large field of Democratic candidates that we're seeing for this election, including calling certain candidates unelectable, like they used to call Donald Trump yeah. unelectable? Yeah. That's a good point. Do you, would you agree, Molly? I, I guess I, I don't see the the Democratic candidates going after one candidate at, like the, some of the Republican candidates went after Donald Trump at a certain point. Um, I don't I don't see that same. Like I said before, when Scott Walker got out, like his whole message was, "We have to make sure this guy isn't president." You know, it's it's an emergency. You know, I have to get out of the race. You know. Um, and I don't feel that in this field. I don't know, you guys might disagree, but. Anyone think that the moderates are going to unite to stop Bernie? Um, I think they might, yes, absolutely. I think there'll be a calculation being made throughout this iterative process, which, you know, it has these big, like, vectors. Whoa, whoa, someone's up, down, train wreck <laughs> over here. And you never know exactly what it's going to happen. It does winnow the field. And then you're going to end up with, yeah, that kind of calculation being made. But it will depend on where the, the calculation, which states, you know, get to make the calculation. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, we're in a different things. I mean, I've been doing presidential politics for, you know, for a long time. I'm really old. Started on the Mondial campaign. And it's changed so much that it's all this, like, fast, iterative, you know, celebrity-driven, moment-driven attention. The whole world is focused on this, and that's the story. There's, it doesn't evolve as it used to. It's like this electric, rapid, and it changes even faster. Can I go out on a limb? Go out on a limb. Um, when Joe Biden gets out, it's going to change. Mm -hmm. um, Joe Biden has run. I love Joe Biden. Iowans love Joe Biden. The best president of many people's lifetime was Barack Obama. That means the best vice president of their lifetime was, for Democrats, was Joe Biden. Joe Biden ran a very poor campaign. There was, and the race was nationalized. He polled very well, but on the ground, there was nothing. It was months when Democrats were so excited with the field that we had, and then Joe Biden jumped into the pool and it messed it all up. He, you know, and I was, and I've told people for months that Joe Biden is, is weak. His, his rallies are poorly attended. He's got nothing. He's got, I mean, I hate to say this, but the longer he needs the South Carolina vote to be today, the longer he campaigns, the longer and more people see him, the more his, <laughs> his poll yeah. numbers will go down. But, but don't Joe you Biden also has, think that if he hadn't appeared, and I didn't appreciate it as a stammering issue, I wish he would have talked about that more, that he appeared to be old and maybe, you know, beginning some dementia. I mean, just the way it appeared. And I know I watched the debates. Like, oh my gosh, he's like old. You know, he could like fall apart in a debate with Trump. So we can't take that risk. And I, I've heard a few people say that, but I don't think. I think that's what some people were seeing. I certainly. What was really it. brought it home to me was following Joe Biden on the trail two weeks ago at Iowa. 
He didn't have rallies, I promise you, that were even a quarter as large as this room. For the former vice president to have a room of 30 people, when Mayor Pete could draw 2,000, mm -hmm. Donald Trump was drawing 18,000 or something, and Joe Biden got 30. The idea that he was going to be the nominee seemed to me pretty crazy. And, and I always thought he might, this might happen, because he, he was the front runner after Gary Hart dropped out in 1988 with the gang of dwarves, and Biden was the charismatic up-and-comer until he plagiarized Neil Kinnock's speeches, and then he was caught with that, uh, and, he had, and he had some problems with the resume problems, and so this charismatic front runner was, had to leave the race. Then he ran again, and it didn't work, and it's almost a tragedy in my view. So he didn't run last time, but now he did, and it's probably not gonna work again. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, I'll just be real quick, is that Ukraine, the criticisms of him are real. You try walking in my county and telling a Republican that what Hunter Biden did and what Joe Biden did and not saying that wasn't okay, you try telling them that and it won't go very far. While a jury wouldn't convict Hunter Biden of, of anything wrong, a, ju uh, a jury of his peers, a jury of a dozen boy or Girl Scouts would say that was just plain wrong and we know it was wrong. And, and people know that, that we all have relatives that don't know anything about energy in Ukraine, but they're not getting millions of dollars for it. And you know, Iowa is a state of Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. Right, that's another <laughs> issue. But the, yeah, but so the Democrats know this, and it hasn't been right. articulated very well. We, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, so I want to give our panelists the last chance to have a, a final say on what you're expecting for the, for the year ahead. Um, Shia, what, what's Illinois' big contribution going to be to the 2020 election? It's just going to be a rock-solid Democratic seat, and nothing's going to change? Everybody's watching some of the local races, the state's attorney race. I think that could drive a lot of uh, voters to the polls uh, in March. Uh, which will, you know, in turn affect the the presidential primary too here. Great, Molly. Wisconsin going to be the decisive state. Everything <laughs> will be resolved. I think everyone's acting that way, so I hope we live up to their expectations because that's, that's a lot of pressure from the state. Bob, Iowa, purple or solidly Republican? Iowa's a purple state, and I think that the organization the Democrats are bringing will. Uh, will turn Iowa blue again. And, uh, but our delegate counts are so small, it's not gonna make a big difference like your states. And last of all, Michigan, what's wrong? I would be very relieved if the massive turnout of new populations in the South and Georgia and others in the Southwest carried the day and took us off the hook in Wisconsin and Michigan. <laughs> um, and, but I'm afraid we will be the ones responsible again. And so I personally, just speaking for myself, not for the Chicago Council on Global Affairs or anybody else, you know, am just so anxious about what can be the, the, the path that mobilizes people to get out and vote, and, and in my view, you know, ends this moment of, of national insanity and damage and embarrassment. Thank you very much. Well, please thank the panel.